the week before we had our very ser first service here at Center Point, we were over in Albany on a Sunday morning. And the Albany United Church of the Nazarene, where some of you folks are here from, that helped us start this church, um, w was going to have a sending off service for us. They uh, had a special prayer time and, and blessing. And before we got to the church, we were sitting in the dollar store parking lot over there, right in Albany, the big dollar store market or whatever they call it, the big super dollar, whatever it is. And, and Andrea had went in to get some cough drops or something, and I was sitting in the truck, and I was just watching people. Anybody here like to people watch? Man, I was just kind of watching people. And, and I saw these things happening that bothered me. I saw what I'd call church person after church person going in and out of the doors there at the dollar store. And I call them church people because they were dressed up, they had their hair fixed, and you could tell they were going somewhere nice. It was on a, it was on a Sunday morning. So just deduction there, I figured that they're, that they're church people. And I watched them come in and out of dollar store, and I got to watch several of them because if your wife's like mine, it took her longer in dollar store than I always think it should. So I watch these people, and I notice as they pass people who obviously are not going to church, the people who are not dressed up, the people who are in their pajamas still, you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been to a store, been out in town, been to Walmart, anywhere on a Sunday morning when maybe for some reason you weren't at church or you were sick or somebody in your family was sick, and you see people that obviously are not going to church. And I saw something in their interactions that deeply, deeply troubled me. I noticed that every time this church person or these church people would pass these folks that obviously were not headed to the church, they walked by with their chin up. They didn't even recognize them. Man, they, they walked right by them, person after person. They walked by with their chin up, probably in a hurry to get back to church so somebody wouldn't get their spot, right? They couldn't, they, they couldn't even have a conversation with them. They didn't smile at them. They didn't look at them. They didn't acknowledge them. So the Lord just spoke to me and he said, he said, Tim, the, this, is, this is the church. And the, the, this, the, the church, you should recognize these people. You should see them. And I thought, man, how many times have I been in such a hurry or have I been headed to church how many times have I been out on a Monday through Friday or Saturday living my life, doing my own thing, going about my own business, and I pass person after person after person who needs to know of the hope that I pack around with me that I don't even take a second to even recognize that there's something I have inside of me that I could share that might make their world a better place. My question for you this morning when you look around our city and you interact every day with people who you know don't know the Lord, do you see them? Do you, do you recognize them? Do you take time to notice the people that you interact with every day that need the Lord? Or is your life like sometimes mine is? that I pass them on the street. I stand behind them in line in Subway. I see them at the post office. I run into them at the dollar store and I never ever take time to think about their, their soul, their salvation. I wanna share with you from Acts chapter three this morning. Acts chapter 3, it's up on the screen here if you want to follow along with us. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. 
Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So I want to paint this picture for you. Oh, you, you, can, you can take a look at those pictures. I got a couple of funny pictures and then a couple of serious ones. I thought that was funny. Family kidnapped by ninjas. Need money for karate lessons. Are the things that go through your mind when somebody's asking for something? Right? When somebody got those signs or they want some help, you think, well, they're probably going to spend it on who knows what. So some people have made jokes about, about what they're going to do with the money because they know you're already thinking, you know, what, that you're, they're going to do something inappropriate with it. Go to the next one. I like that one. I think that was great. <laughs> Okay, you can stop on that one. So Peter and John, it says they're going into the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. So when you read this, you get the idea this is a normal time for them to go to the temple, even though 3 in the afternoon is not the time we go to the temple. 3 in the afternoon, you get the, you get the idea this was when people came to the temple. So it says at 3 o'clock, their normal time to go to the temple to pray they walk by, they're getting to the front gates, and they see this man sitting there. He's crippled. And it says that they bring him there every day. And they set him at the temple gates there every day to beg. When I read that, I think about how many people pass this man every day of their lives. They see him sitting there, and they've got the answer to his deepest need inside of them, and they don't even take time to stop and say anything to him. And you know what's even more interesting? The fact that he sits there every day indicates that whatever it is he's looking for, he hadn't found it yet. It makes me think of the people that we pass on our way in and out of the dollar store on a Sunday morning before church when we're in such a hurry to get to the church that we overlook the work that God has really put us here to do. So many people, so many people have passed this man day after day after day good church people and it appears like none of them has ever even tried to meet his need before And you know it says he's begging for money but in reality he didn't need money he needed the Lord and that was the one thing that all these people that go by him day after day after day had that they could have shared with him but none of them even took time Probably because they had to get to the temple. They had to get to church, right? Somebody was going to get their seat. Do you realize that, that what we do on Sunday morning, do you realize that's the easy part? Do you realize that coming here and singing and praying and reading the Bible and giving God some of your some of your offerings, do you realize that is the easy part? That the real work that God called you and I to do is not just what happens in here on a Sunday morning, but it's those people laying right outside the gates of our temple that need to know who He is. As we speak and meet, sing, pray, and preach, there are people right now literally right outside our door that have this deep, profound need to know that there's something better. And God help me and God help us to make sure that we're always the kind of people who are willing to share that with them, to show them that, to show them what it is that we carry inside of us that's given us this hope 
and this joy and this contentment to know that there's a greater day coming. What's the Bible says that, 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 that this situation that we currently find ourselves in is going to achieve for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all these things that we deal with every day. And my question for you is all these people that are laying literally right outside the front doors of our church, do you see them? And, and I don't mean do you, do you see them. I mean, are you looking at them? Do you see them? Do you see them the way God sees them? I want our church to be a church that seeks and saves the lost. Just like what the Bible says about Jesus and why he came. I don't want us just to, just to save them. I want us to find them. I want us to search for them. And the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And it also says in 1 John, it says that anyone who claims... To live in Him must walk as Jesus did. Amen. So man, if you claim His name, you better walk the way He walks. And I tell you, one of the ways He walked was He came to seek and save the lost. And I'll tell you something, if Jesus were to go to our dollar store today, and man, He was on His way in, He probably wouldn't be looking like a lot of us look anyway, right? The church people. He was more, more homely, more simple, more like the, the rest of us, more like I want to be. But I guarantee you, He wouldn't pass by and not see them because he knew the work he was here to do and it wasn't to get to the church man it was to be the church Amen. and when I read this story I get so hung up in all these people that just keep passing this guy by and for whatever reason they don't stop and the only thing I can figure out is you know that maybe he just doesn't seem to be worth it <coughs> he's not worth their time, their effort. All these broken people that lay right outside the gates of our church, they need for you to think and believe that they're worth it. I read this quote, maybe you've, you've heard it before, and it says, it says the church is not intended to be a shrine for the saints, but a hospital for the broke and the sick. Man, that's who we are. That's who we want to be. That's why we're here. That's why we are in this concrete building with a wooden platform made out of pallets right in the middle of town. It's because, God help me, I am not going to step over the broken people to get to the church. Because I know what I've got inside. I know what Jesus has given me, and I know it can change people. And I know it can change the world. And I don't want us to be those people that get fixed up on a Sunday morning and step over the broke to get to church. <laughs> Another quote, and man, I love this. I love this. Some people want to live within the sound of a chapel bell, but I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Hey, doesn't that say who we need to be and what we ought to be about and the kind of people we ought to be and the way we ought to feel about people? Our church is here to rescue people, man, from their sin and misery and brokenness. And when the world asks this question, who cares about me and who can help? We respond with, his name is Jesus and my name is Tim and I love you too. It was at a major Bible college. There was a two-way tie for first in the class of these graduating, these graduating students, seminary students. They were both tied. And every year, the first in the class always got to be an associate pastor at this big church, you know, right down the road. So there's all this prestige in being first. So there were these two students that were both tied for first place. And the professor came up with an idea. He said... He said, here's how we're going to determine who graduates first in the class. He sent them on a scavenger hunt. And he gave them this list of all these things. It sounds kind of bogus, but when you hear the rest of the story, you'll, you'll, it's pretty good. He gives them this big long list of all these things they have to gather and they have to bring them back to his classroom. And there's some really just obscure items on the list. You know, a certain translation of the Bible, the Ten Commandments, 
an old offering plate, you know, stuff like that they could find on campus there somewhere. So he sends them out, and about three hours later, they start coming back with all this stuff. Now, what they don't realize is he has paid a man to dress up in homeless kinds of clothes to set them right outside the front doors of the auditorium building where they're headed back in with all their stuff. And he's paid this person to ask for help as they walk in. So it's about three hours later, and the first student gets back, and he's got all his stuff, and he realizes the other man's still way behind him. So he gets to the front door. He steps over this homeless man who's asking for help, and he takes him into the professor. About 15 minutes later, the second student comes through, and he's got his bag of stuff from the scavenger hunt, and he gets to this homeless man on front, and he sets the bag down, and he helps the guy out. I, I don't know what the guy was asking for. He was just asking for help. So the second student, he stops, he helps this man, he gives him whatever he needed. When he's done, he goes on in the classroom and he finds the professor and the first place finisher are in the classroom. And the professor reads them the scriptures from the Bible where Jesus talks about the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And he tells the young man that stepped over the homeless to be first in the class and he said, he said the real test is what happened to you at the front door. And the words I've been sharing with you this morning, in the same exact way, he tells him, if you're going to be real, if you're going to make an impact for the kingdom of God, you have to be the church and not be worried so much about getting to it. We can't step over the broken people in our town and look the other way to get to the church. When we do that, I think we've missed the point. And man, I, when I saw those people going in and out of the store that Sunday morning, I said, God, don't let that be me. And then even more than that, I said, God, don't let that be our church. Don't let that be who we are. So Peter and John, they stopped. And it says they looked at this man. And they made him look at them. And I thought that was kind of strange, too. You know, here's this guy that that he's asking people for money, right? And I know as a good teacher, any good educator knows if you make eye contact with somebody, you can get something from them, right? That's why kids, when you ask them a question, they don't want to answer it, they do this, they look down. I had a guy said the other day in a, in a meeting I was in, he said, and it was teachers, but teachers do the same thing. We're at meetings, they all look away because they don't want to answer the person presenting. And he said, just because you're not looking at me doesn't mean I'm not looking at you. And everybody started laughing. But anyway, here's this man, and he asked people for money. He's asking all these people that come by day after day after day. He's asking them for something. But it says that he's asking for money, and he's not even looking at them. And I thought, man, why is it? It's because he's just broken. He's ashamed. He, he don't want to make eye contact with them. He's, he's ashamed of himself. He's broken. He's got this great need, and here's all these people that, that nobody's helping him. But it says, Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and then said, look at us. So they stopped. They were headed to church to pray. It says they were headed about 3 o'clock in the afternoon to pray, and they stopped. And they may even be late for prayer time. My word. And they make him look at them. And they give him the one thing that he's needed all along. When he thought he needed money, what he really needed was the Lord. And they gave it to him, and it fixed everything that was wrong with him. I mean, he was actually crippled. He's asking for money, but man, they healed him. But in a so much more general way, here's a man that sat at the gates, the front door of the church, and people literally stepped over him day after day after day. And the one person that decided to take the time to stop and see him as he was. He's broken, hurt. This man that desperately needed to know the love of Jesus Christ, and they gave it to him. 
And at the beginning of the story, this crippled, humbled, shameful man that wouldn't even make eye contact with all these Christian people that are walking by him every day, he's shouting praises of joy, <laughs> jumping around, proclaiming Jesus, man, and what Jesus did for him. And all it took, all it took was Peter and John to do what nobody else was willing to do. To see Him in His brokenness and to give Him what He needed most. You know, in the New Testament, in the New Testament, I'm going to come back here and join you for a second, okay, so I can see the... So I can see the screen. In the New Testament, where, where, there, where Jesus ri rides into town on that young donkey, if you remember that, it was when the people first recognized Him as Lord. They're shouting, pra shouting His name, shouting praises. It's right before He gets arrested. But here's Jesus, and for the first time ever in His life on earth, He's recognized as a king. He's recognized as royalty. It's the one where they're, they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. They're laying palm trees down because His donkey... Is even so holy because he's on it that it can't even touch the ground. He's happy. He's smiling. He's excited. And then it says that he's on the Mount of Olives on this donkey and he overlooks the city of Jerusalem. You see that picture on the screen. Jesus overlooks the city of Jerusalem and it says he starts to cry. And he cries because he's looking at Jerusalem. And if you know anything about Jerusalem, that it had Jewish people in it, that the Jews did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He knows he's about to die, and he knows that here's this city full of people that still don't believe in him. And he starts crying, and he says to himself, he says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. And his heart's broken for these people, and it's because he knows he's got the answer to their deepest question in their lives and he knows he's not going to be around to share it anymore with them and his heart's broken because he knows it's full of unsaved people the first time I saw this this is actually the, the album cover for a deed it's called until the whole world hears the first time I saw that picture I cried and I cried because if you look at it here's this little boy and he's overlooking the city. And he's got that big megaphone. And I can't see his face, but the way he looks, he looks sad to me. His shoulders are drooped. The megaphone's beside him. It's not in his hand. He's not using it anymore. And it's almost like he's been up there trying to get them all to listen to him about Jesus. And it's like he got discouraged and just quit trying. <laughs> or why else would the, would the megaphone be right beside him? Why wouldn't it be in his hand? Why wouldn't it be up, shouting, excited? But then I see, man, there's room for all kinds of people on that wall with him. And he's up there by himself. And you just happen to think, what if the reason they can't hear him is because he's the only one telling them? What would happen if there was all these people on each side of him? Man, they had their arms around each other. And they were all about Jesus and what he could do for them. You think, wouldn't it make a difference, you know? Go to the last picture. There's a picture from the top of the mighty Alpine Motel. The one you can see right outside our front door right here. Overlooking Berksville. We live in a town full of broken people. Just like any other town. All of us all of us carry around the answer 
to the problems that all our people have. And my question to you is every day you live your life here in this town, when you pass these people, when you work with them, when you see them at the store, when you pass them on the road, when you play softball with them, whatever else it is you do, do you see them? Or do you step over them on your way to the church house? We're going to finish this morning with a song. And it's kind of a charge to our church to be these kinds of people. To be the kind of people that will never, ever step over the broken to get to the church. And if you know the words, you're welcome to sing along with us. And if you don't, why don't you just, just bow your head in reverence and pray to the Lord, God, help me not to step over the broken people. Lord, help me to see them. Help me to see them in their brokenness. Help me to share what I've got inside of me that can change.